Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the Retool Tour. Day number two, we're in Mooresville, North Carolina. I'm joined by Mr. Daniel Dew. Hey Daniel. Hello Christian. So uh, we're up at the desk. Uh, Tuesdays, we're normally up at the desk, but normally it's Tuesday's coffee address and today it's Tuesday's Daniel address. So uh, <laughs> change this up just a little bit. And so, uh, listen, so basically what we're going to be doing uh, for this presentation uh, during day two of the Retool Tour is uh, we're just going to be talking about modern manufacturing and concepts in modern manufacturing, principles that shops can use to become leaner, that can become more profitable, um, both small and mid-sized shops, right? Yes. And even large shops. Yeah, I mean, our, one of our goals is we want to take uh, and apply a similar concept to both sheet good and solid wood. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our unique positions in the market is that we have a full line of both high-end woodworking and high-end sheet goods. Mm -hmm. And um, we really want to sort of get the concept across of how to go uh, custom to order without having any real ramifications in a production mo production model. Right. You know, in a higher right, right, right. higher level sure. production model. Sure, sure. Um, so we're going to be, um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the concepts, uh, conceptual stuff. We're going to be looking at some software here as well, um, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So yeah, Daniel, I think we should talk about examples of how we walk through a particular, you know, uh, example of a specific product. We right, can, We sure. can talk cabinet, five-piece cabinet doors, sheet goods. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. So real quick though, like broad level, um, when we're talking about products as far as not so much our customers' products, but the product that is running this, we're talking about Envision software. Yes. Right. Yeah. Envision and some of the satellite softwares that go around Envision. Right. So Envision almost is like a, like, yeah, like you said, it has satellite um, softwares. It's almost like a family of software yeah. um, that all work together dependent on the shop's application for it. Yeah, what they want to make and the machines sure. they have. So it's all modular so that you, mm -hmm. you can build it out. Yeah, yep. So uh, anyway, uh, we're live. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to remind everybody we're live. If you have questions uh, for Daniel, if you have questions about um, just don't make them too hard. Yeah, don't don't <laughs> stump them. We haven't been able to though. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, if you have questions, put them in the comments and uh, and we'll get to them. Uh, but with that said, let's talk about um, let's talk about modern manufacturing. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that um, you know uh, that's a real uh, onus behind this idea mm -hmm. is um, the concept of uh, foreign competition. Okay. Right. If you look at the manufacturing models, because I mean, this is why we're a global market uh, sure. player. Sure. So I mean, we sell machines everywhere. So we we know what other manufacturers, the you know, without getting too specific, the people that are making products that are shipping over here, a lower inexpensive product, right. maybe less quality. Yeah. Right. Yep. We know how they're doing stuff. Their mm -hmm. their their manufacturing model is the same as ours was in both sheet goods and solid wood, 20 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're buying the the large. Um, uh, volume machines, mm -hmm. right? That are making ten thousand of the same thing. Yeah. Right. So from our vantage point, for the American manufacturer, right, we have to become better at making lower volume, more customizable type products. So in the end, if our customer is getting what they want to buy, right, and we can make it without the additional cost of manufacturing, yeah, right, that secures the local manufacturer. Now we now. Would you call that mass customization? That's exactly what mass customization. It is. That's, okay, that's all right. Because that is, I mean, a lot of people kind of throw that term around, as you know. Yeah. But that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and within the applications group, we're we're slightly more technical than uh, some of the other sales guys you'll talk to. I hope. Right. And uh, we want to really differentiate our terminology between custom mm -hmm. and customizable. Right. If okay. you think about most like five piece door shops, most kitchen cabinets, they're not custom. Right, you're not designing a whole new cabinet. You're taking one of their stock cabinets, right. box construction types, yep. and you're modifying. You're customizing a standard, mm -hmm. right? So what we want to do is ramp up the number of variables that you can change in the order, dimension, color, species, you know, th those kind of hardware, and make it so that the manufacturing floor is independent of those choices. Right. Right. So right. the machining is taken taking those order variables into account and just machine you're already taking those parts to machines 
Right, exactly. So have those machines execute those, yeah. those, those choices without any uh, interaction with the operators on the floor. So really, so from the point of, when we call this order entry, we're talking about in, in the, basically uh, in the office, we're entering an order, Yes. right? But then there's no um, alternative logic that needs to go into it that, that's built, throughout the machining process. That's built into your construct, your order process. The ma right. machining and everything's built in. So if I want this five piece door with those hinges and that handle, yeah. and those hinges and handles require different machining, as I order it, the G code is made automatically. Correct, so we're not at the machine saying, oh, this has handle B, I gotta go find program for handle B, or now somehow, you know, ad lib yeah. a handle B milling program. One of the most difficult things is how do I let my customer choose hinge B with hard with handle R, right, right, without having my it, it matter to my operator. Yes. So right. that's the, okay. Right. Okay. If it just happens, the operator is, sure. is, is machining parts. The machines are reacting to the parts as they arrive. Mm -hmm. Right. So those choices. So I mean, you're producing G code at a massive level. Mm -hmm. Right. That's but, right. But it's all happening behind the scenes with the order intake in mind as you produce it. Oh, so absolutely. And I think that a lot of folks. So. In a small shop environment, I think that's important because you're putting less responsibility. All this computing power is happening behind the scenes in the software instead of on the shop floor. Yeah, and typically, and, okay, sorry. And now I was going to say, and in a mid-sized shop, that's important because now you have so many more people at play. Um, you know, the consistency is always going to be there when it's behind the scenes rather yeah. than when it's being handled on the shop floor. Right. And moreover, I mean, the small custom shop already understands this. This is their That's business right. model. That's right. The problem they have is they have a restricted catalog, right? They, they, right. The conventional thing is, right, if I'm a small kitchen cabinet shop, right, typically they're not making their own doors. Yes, right. That's right. why the door right, shop. Right, right. That's why the That's door right. shop exists. Yep, and, and they, they just order those doors in. Right, absolutely. Okay, and they're they they're not making their own other stuff, right? They're basically a small custom box shop, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And then they have to order the materials and organize that. Maybe they right. have a nesting machine, a bore and down machine, edge band. Yep. Right, and that's the shop. Everything else, oh, it, it, you know, everyone's different, but for the most part, everybody else is buying everything else in. Right. Right. Sure. Because no one sure. no one can be a master at everything. What we're trying to do is expand that catalog of product offerings with the same equipment. Mm -hmm. So that I can take that nesting machine, I can make MDF doors and boxes and other products, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, we're just making G code for the router. That's and what we're doing. How are we organizing that so that it works from more than just sheet good boxes? That's right. Yeah. So, and also though, I, I kind of want to go off on a little bit of a tangent and something that we've talked about a couple different times, which is getting your machinery to really work for you and not just have one single thing that it does always, having yeah. that flexibility, right? Well, we've talked well, about this, well, right? One of the things that I can tell you, it's a, I mean, I think people inherently know this, <laughs> right? But on the machine side of things, we really know this, right? Whether you're a furniture maker, a cabinet shop, a door shop, a uh, flooring shop, everybody's buying the same equipment, right? The difference is, is what's in the front end driving it. Yeah, what's right? driving that equipment. Right, right. And, and now we'll spec the machines differently depending on the accuracy that you need, the volume that you need. There'll be features, right. there'll, there'll be various configurations. Yeah. But, at, but the bottom line, if you're a furniture shop or a five piece door shop or, mm -hmm. or, some of the, or a high volume kitchen shop, you're all buying the same ripsaw. Okay, so just <laughs> just in case uh, we're not all connecting all the dots, so what does that mean? So that means that right. the order entry is the key. Right. Right. And yep. and most most people, their product offering to their customer is restricted by their front end, not right. by the by the equipment. Right. If you, if you look and say, I, I'm buying a ripsaw, for example, we'll, we'll go we'll go very front end. Sure. Right. Sure. Ripsaw does two things. It makes random widths and fixed widths. That's it. And and most people who make solid wood products. They're either making fixed width components mm -hmm. or they're gluing up panels. Yeah, right, 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 right. Sure. So how do you get the order organized to the ripsaw mm -hmm. in such a way that it can do those things regardless of what you're using those fixed widths and randoms for? For it does it right. Yeah, right, right. So sure. you know most people have an order wrench system like a five-piece door shop yep. or a furniture shop, mm -hmm. right? And most of them typically because that's difficult with the integration, their end product offering is restricted to standards. Right. Right. Of so what we're going to show this afternoon with the rip cut line 
is we're going to order stuff completely custom that's got randoms and fixed widths, and we're just going to blow it out and make it in two minutes. Right, yeah. completely custom order. Everything's going to be organized at, at the end of the day, and you know, in two minutes, we're going to order twelve doors. In two minutes, we'll have them all. So again, when the machines know where a piece came from and where it's supposed to go, yes, then we're taking that out of the equation of shop floor human logic. And the operators don't need to know what they're making. The machines are reacting. The operators are just passing material through. For example, on a crosscut saw, they might be defecting. Sure, right. Sure, right. On, on a rip saw, they're isolating the knot so we're not getting the knot on two strips. That's right. right. That's right. Right. So you get longer clear. Mm -hmm. So they're focusing on the material and executing the material on the machines. The machine is executing the order. Right. And, and that's the big difference. And they're not having to navigate or the, make any choices. Or, or determine how to navigate these pieces through the shop. And they also don't need to be aware of any of the customized items in the order. So I think this is a, a really interesting point because for anyone watching out there who runs a shop, who has parts going all over that shop floor, I think the real question is how much time are you spending figuring out how to navigate your parts on a shop floor? Well, maybe this would be a good time to consult the gallery. We have someone who used to do manufacturing. Hey, gallery. <laughs> Right. How much time and effort do you think on a percentage level was spent in navigating choice on the floor, not running machines? Just a percentage wise, 20%, 30%? Probably 20, 25% of the time. Yeah. yeah. Basi Easy. Basically ancillary people on the floor to validate it is done. That's right. Right. And, right. and the choice was implemented on the machining of the part. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're, you're, uh, it's kind of like you're confirming something, you're making choices, you're making decisions, and then you're actually executing that. Right. right. So effectively, you know, how could we get the, all those custom elements of choice built in without adding in any additional cost to the manufacturing? Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're eliminating those ancillary people and steps right. so that everything speeds up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And then you, you can either choose to pass that savings to your customer or you can incorporate that as a value add to, to ensure more business. Sure. Um, or both. Or both. Or both. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah. And typically the turnaround time is faster because you're not managing the things you didn't want to make. Right. Because everything's done to order. All right, so real quick, just to kind of, not to recap, but just to kind of go over a couple high points thus far in this discussion about concepts in modern manufacturing. Um, we're, talking about, we're talking about generating all this logic th uh, for custom pieces yes. at order entry. And when we talk, order entry, we're talking about putting in, I want uh, this door in this style with these dimensions and I want five of them out of oak. For so that box. For for this box, for this job, yes. right? For this actual kitchen. Yeah. So that when we talk about order entry, that's what we're actually talking about. We're actually talking about the order, the, the high level order entry, not the part entry, yeah. but the actual order entry. And also what choices you're exposing in the software to your customer to make choices from. So let's talk about that just real quick on Envision. Um, so Envision allows customers to create these templates mm -hmm. and in the template, then it allows customers to choose the variables that they want to configure uh, yeah. during the life of that product. Yeah, one of the things that's, I mean, from a, from most of the known products that are out there, one of the things that makes Envision different is it, you know, it it's not a product specific, it's a toolbox of instruction, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, if you want to make uh, European boxes, you can make European boxes. You want to make five-piece doors, passage doors, right? You want to make, we have people making custom furniture with it. Uh, that includes all of the joinery aspects, mortise and tenon, sure. mortise and hodge. Right, yep. Um, you know, any of those type, you know, standard joints, right. that's all available in there for five axis routers. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, you can build all that stuff in. It's a toolbox of instruction on how to execute the product on the floor. So basically it's called Envision because the user defines the product he's gonna make. Mm -hmm. And because it doesn't have a fixed product, right, right, it can be anything you want. Sure, And that's sure. why it's called Envision. Yep. And um, so that's the thing, most, most most softwares that have or have a high level order entry and there's many good ones out there mm -hmm. right are restricted on what they can actually execute on the floor right um so that's where i think that that's where we'll kind of take this conversation next is the actual process of bringing from order entry to execution on the shop floor kind of that that process yeah, yeah. and so i mean you know if you have your order entry right 
right? One of the things we can take a small shop, mm -hmm. right? And what they'll find is that what we're doing in a small shop and what we're doing in a big shop is the same, right? So this is infinitely right. scalable. Sure, sure. You know. Yep. Yep. All right. So Daniel, kind of take us through that. Um, let's let's pick a let's just pick a. Um, an application mm -hmm. um, that you've worked with before and kind of take us through what that uh, modern manufacturing concept would look like in that application. Okay. Um, we Which can, one do you want to do? Okay, let's talk, uh, let's talk very, very hard, right? Let's talk uh, low volume, custom, solid wood, fine furniture. Okay. Parametric <laughs> touches, All right? right? Uh, I mean, you know, parametric beds. So uh, we're talking to what percentage of the audience, right? Very little. <laughs> very, very small. Right? But the thing is, that's where we started because when you can do that, right, making European case goods is not hard. Right, exactly. So when you can, when you can uh, create a solution that covers that type of shop, yeah, with then, all that different joinery right, and stuff with like all that. the different joinery, um, then you can then uh, bring that to various applications yes. um, that are maybe up the funnel a little bit that's not as, uh, not yeah. as complex, and, I guess. And this, this particular customer we did, I mean, at the beginning, he was making seven, eight pieces a day. Right. Very high high level, high dollar, mm -hmm. right? And But they were doing it all manually before. I gotcha. Right? right they would sure. have to draw the pieces because yep. when I make it, for example, when I make a hutch, I might, I might have 85 pieces in there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. All the drawers, all the frames, the crown. Yeah. But other than that, it's basically a wood box. Right. Right. It's, right. It's right. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when I... The difference is if I if I make a hutch a little bit wider, right, versus a sheet good box, mm -hmm. right, it affects sixty five pieces. It doesn't affect three pieces. Right. Right. So all of that has to change and the machining of every piece is different now. Mm -hmm. Right. So all these different choices affect all these different um, uh, characteristics of every part and how they fit together. So going back so going to that um, you know solid wood fine furniture application mm -hmm. they're dealing with a lot of different types of joints in, yes. the, in those pieces based of based on the product they have different joinery for every application right and that joint and that joinery the actual joints need to be uh it's not a one size fits all as There's, many yeah. of you guys know out there um you can't just always do um the same size uh morrison tenon mm -hmm. you know <laughs> so that has to that has to scale but not always the same way. And I think yeah. that's where um, I, I kind of, why don't you speak on that a little bit as far as in this specific application, um, how do you find that you have to scale the joints? Okay. Well, I mean, for example, right, if, if I want to produce a parametric hutch again, right, mm -hmm. and this hutch has inset joinery, mm -hmm. right, so the doors actually fit inside the frame. Right, sure. Right, okay, and I'm going to make that parametric, right? You really can't do all that stuff and maintain the gaps in the frame so everything looks symmetrical, mm -hmm. right, by hand, without okay. a lot right. of lot of redo and redo and manually sh uh, shimming the edge. Now, if I do every part, now this particular customer, what we did is he's a he's a small cut first shop. Okay. So yep. so he's a cut first shop, and then he goes to a straight line. Right. Lose all his panels up. Yep. And then we label everything, identify, it, and then we run it on a five axis router. Mm -hmm. Right, so basically, because of the volume, we can't really justify all that machining, you know, like rip saws and you know, you know sure, and all that sure. stuff, because right. you're making five to eight pieces a day, right? <laughs> right. So right, right. But we were easily able to justify a five-axis router, right, because of all the single-purpose machines that were behind this. And, and again, it, but you can only justify that with having all that logic done up front. That's right. Yeah, because if you think about uh, uh, so, for example, uh, in my hutch metaphor, right? Say I want to make arch top rails, mm -hmm. right? For glass inserts. Yeah, this is a good example. Okay, okay, right. So now I've got to be able to do, and so in order to get the inset joinery right, we went with a French miter joint on the cabinet doors, mm -hmm. right? So all the all the parts are getting machined. Right. Right. Okay. And so if I have a mortise and tenon joint, now I'm going to produce that with an arch. Yeah. Now I'm that my shoulder can't be 45 degrees. Right, as that it fits. doesn't work so anymore. It's, so it's got <laughs> to be able to make that calculation so, depending on how wide the door is mm -hmm. would determine the radius sure. of of the arch. Sure. Right, because right. it's the the key thing is the pitch. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, that's exactly okay. right. So depending on how wide it is, right, that's got a wider radius which determines the width of the top rail. And all of this plays into how that shoulder fits together. Right, what kind of angle that you're looking right. at All there. these calculations are being done behind the scene. That's right. That's right. right. So it all is just going to happen. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, and, and I so, always, so, so it goes from uh, cut first, uh, straight lined, re-ripped, glued up, take it to the machine and machine that, and then you do assembly and it's slot right. on full beat. Sure. Right. Right. So we're taking a lot of the uh, assembly time away mm -hmm. and the organization because the part's never a dimension, it's a component. That's exactly right. Right. It's identified, it is what it's going to be, and so the, the cost of managing all these pieces is a lot less because you only make the pieces you need. That's right. That's right. Right. And that's so, something that's really hard to do overseas. So now, so uh, when we, when we're then outside of that application, that, that furniture construction mm -hmm. type of application, the same principles apply. Yeah. Because now instead of uh, having to scale uh, a certain type of joint, you're having to scale other things, you're having to configure other things, and you're having, uh, this is one thing I really wanted to touch on, and you're having to do it in an easy to use, quick interface yes. at order entry. Yes. Um, so before I go into another application, which I do want to touch on maybe one more, um, I do want to touch on the fact that when we're talking about order entry, we're not talking about this clunky um, having to open up all these diagrams and, and change uh, yeah. and find this one dimension and change it and key it in and change it. You're talking about navigating a catalog saying this is what I want to make and this is how I want it made. Right. And it just specified the product. That's yep. it. And, and going back to what we were saying, the user who sets up the catalog can determine the attributes, the actual attributes that of, of every product the, that the user who's ordering it can actually choose. Yes. Right. And that's important. Yep. I, th I think that's really important because what happens there is the actual um, is that the actual user who's using Envision, mm -hmm. okay, may not have to be the power user of the company, right? You know, and many it, times what we want is we want someone who knows how the machines work, right? It knows right. how the joints work to aid the office person. So the office person typically says, I know I make blue cabinets, right? The, the guy on the floor knows, well, this is how the hinges work on those blue cabinets. <laughs> right. This is how they fit together. Yes, that's right. This is where the holes need to be. So making that template, making that product cag, uh, catalog is a collaboration. Yes. But then ordering a product is a matter of, of simply uh, choosing the variables or, or plugging in the variables that you want for yeah. that specific product. And the, product. Difference, the difference is right now, most people need that floor knowledge mm -hmm. on the floor. Yep. The people who know how to get things done, right? you will always be dependent on them because they know how to get things done. That's right. What we're doing is taking those rules that they use and transferring them into the order entry system. Into the order entry right. system. And so from right. this point forward, right, we know the rules. You can build that into the template. So it will just move. Yep. And the alterations of the part will be considered at the front end and taken into account at the entity right. code machine. All right, so one more application I want to talk about, and then I want to see uh, what you got to show us here, um, which is um, an actual solid wood cabinet door shop. Mm -hmm. So a door shop, um, we've been in many of these, and uh, and so they'll have a number of different styles. Yes. Uh, they'll have, obviously, doors come in a variety of sizes, <laughs> wouldn't you say? <laughs> almost infinite. Uh, right, almost infinite. Um, and so you're having to deal with species, uh, sizes, styles, um, at times finishes. Uh, so you're having to deal with these different attributes. So just kind of take us through, what would a door shop's catalog in Envision kind of look like? Um, well, if you're making stick and cope doors, right, you, I mean, basically we can have two templates. We can have a miter template and we can have a stick and cope template. Okay. Because, right. I, I mean, sure. you could actually wind them into one, depending on how complicated you want to make your templates. Right. But, um, so effectively, right, if I'm defining a stick and cope door, right, I have two product types. I, ha I have fixed width component and I have glued up panel. Okay, right. right. Yep. So yep. I would define my top rail in reference to how it is defined against the door. Mm -hmm. So the length of the rail is the width of the door minus two times style width plus two uh, cope depths, mm -hmm. right, because it's got to fit, you know, if you're, if you're doing a uh, cope and stick joint. Absolutely. Right, right. so you sure. have to take that into consideration. So now when I order the door, all my rails to be the right length, mm -hmm. right? The style is the is the height of the door. Yep. So I, you have to define each component every time in the machining that goes with it. Right. Right. And then what we have is we have product types. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the in the template you'll define it as a zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And each one of those has a process around it. All right. Right. So the ripsaw knows it processes fixed widths like this and randoms like that. 
Ah, uh, okay. Right, sure. and then if you if you wrap G-code around it, right, now it'll get ripped, mold, cut, machined. Okay, right, right. Sure. Depending sure. on the process you want, you'll give mm -hmm. it like a product type. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, if it's a, so I can have a template that's got beam saw point to point, yep. nesting, rip mold cut, all in, I can have all those different parts in one template. In one template. And so, so when I order choose, it, it just goes. And when we say one template, we're talking about this is a one, cataloged item. Uh, yeah, a cataloged item. So as as a as a just as a, as an example, a uh, recessed panel coping and stick door. I mean, yes. this this would be a catalog item. Yeah, that could you, be one if catalog. You, if you item. think about it, right right now, if you if 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 you are already making that product, you know how to make it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and so right. if you tra if you took all the rules and transferred it to the front. When you order it and you ordered it this way, right? It should know how to execute that product because because you already know how to do it. Right? Now, just, on, now on a real life uh, in a real life application, what then? Uh, I guess you would call them attributes. Would you allow the user to define on say that type of a product? Uh, um, the most important attributes are the attributes his customer would like to have. <laughs> really? Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the thing we bypass because a lot of times. Right, we have to, we have, as a manufacturer in the United States, have to consider what can I do effectively, mm -hmm. right? And most of the restriction on the higher end product is how do I manage this part? If I've got a bunch of single purpose machines in line, yep. I have to know how this exception I'm gonna do is gonna be executed as I take this part through four machine steps. Right, sure. Right, what we're gonna encourage is that we take it to, for example, a wood part for a window, a door, a passage door, like we did earlier today, right, is take it to a router, mm -hmm. right? Now you can't do that at high volumes, right? But high value, right, you can do that. And so all the machining is taken into account in one step, so the part doesn't move and everything's executed on the part. So now it's ready for assembly. Right. Effectively, like Nathan likes to say, we slow down to speed up. Right. So, okay, so, but at the order entry, uh, at the order entry part, the, the attributes can be defined so that you're not putting all that um, uh, all that computing power onto the person ordering the part. No, they don't you, do anything. They, they, they don't. don't the, the person the person who uses Envision is typically not the person who defined Envision. Exactly. Oh, right, right, right. And we we had discussed that, right? And so now the the actual user who's who's import inputting the order. Yes. Give us some uh, just an idea of if you're talking about this cabinet door, what are they really having to know? The, the height, the width. What the customer, so the customer says, I want to buy this door, mm -hmm. right? And so they would say what the heights are, how, ma how many, how what's many, the height, right? what's yeah, the sure. width, what's, what width? species they want, what's the profile. All, right? all which is what's coming from the customer. Yeah, and for example, yep. right, if you had a cabinet door situation, right, and you might set your template up, so once it exceeds a certain height, you induce a center rail. So that, oh, that sure. Okay, sure, sure, so sure. those choices can be built in. Yep. Or you, you know, if you like that, otherwise you could make a door and you could give it a restraint on how tall you can make it. Right. And make another template. Which we all that, know that, 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 that happens all the time. Which is a door right. with a center rail. So it depends on how you like to think about your catalog. Mm -hmm. You can have one that encompasses the change. Or if you know that I, I want to make this kind of door, you would go to a different. It's it, you know you go to a different template. Right. So it depends you, on how you like to yeah. see it. So if you want to see a, a single panel door template and then another template that's a double panel, you can see that. Or if you want to just work in that once you get to a certain constraint, you it go converts. double, yes, right? right? And you can do that too. And, and again, it's like from the programming side, mm -hmm. it's hard to say it's like this or like that because different people think of it different. Right, 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 right. You know, sure. and, and like you know, one of the one of the real restrictions from trying to execute a high end custom job through an ERP is the ERP doesn't know how to take these because it's a your European components, not mm -hmm. assemblies, mm -hmm. right. right? So how these variables affect that? You typically have to define everything before you can make anything on a product. To here we're we're bypassing that and we're we're jumping right across it. Right, right. This is the thing. This is how I want it. Now go make it. Yep. I sure. never really know the definition of the components ahead of time. Yep. So one other thing that I think is important to mention is that when we're working with different templates, the actual yep. templates have their own sets of attributes. So if going back to that cabinet door application, mm -hmm. a, a, if you have a single panel template, a double panel template, well, maybe that double panel template has a couple more attributes that the user has to define because that's just the nature of the part. Well, uh, for example, a white millimeter upper mm -hmm. is going to have fewer choices than a 
at like a parametric height, so like we were talking about. <laughs> right, right. right. It's, it's got to have 37 order attributes. That's right. To where a white height with, you know, yeah. things like that. If, if, um, if any of you have ever um, done a demo on Envision, um, or will do an demo uh, on Envision, I think, uh, one, I think that's one of the neatest shots is just the catalog of random stuff. Yeah, that we have in our Envision catalog here I have to at, at Mooresville. For it <laughs> yeah, there's, so much stuff. I mean, there's furniture, there's cabinets, Upholstered there's furniture. There's... There's, I mean, there's so much random stuff, but that actually illustrates the power of the software. Is that it's not just for cabinet doors. You 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 literally have a white melamine uh, slab door template next to a like a fine furniture with all these joints, yeah. with like glass doors and mullions and all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. We have coffee tables with complete zippers, you know, uh, as far as the construction, method, right. it's all dovetail. It's 37 <laughs> inches of dovetails. So uh, <laughs> ju just for that, you should get a demo of the software just to see this uh, ridiculously abstract and uh, eclectic, I should yeah. say, uh, collection of templates. All right, so Daniel, why don't you talk to us? Um, what are we looking at here? And um, um, yeah, well, here is uh, this is the latest thing. So uh, for for the most part, for the last uh, let me stand up. Yeah. For the most part, for the last five years, what we've been working on is execution, right? How to take these product schemes and build a rip mold cut rip cut uh, type process around how to do this, whether it's beam saw point to point nesting, mm -hmm. right? When to apply what, right? And how to make the catalog reflect that. Yep. Okay. So we have got a good feeling about, you know, how to do all these different types of products. We categorize it into process, mm -hmm. right? So now what we want to do is we want to visualize the floor, right? Right. So what we did is we came up with this product called cadet, right? What cadet does is I got a little, little printout so I can show you. So it creates, uh, when Envision runs, Envision's gonna make the labels that you need. Right. Right, and it's also gonna make cart slot, right, that's one of the new things that we've added is, so Envision will define the cart slot, so as, whether it's coming off a Dempter saw, coming off a nested base router or mm -hmm. a beam saw, its destination is gonna be known in the form of the assembly it's in, because mm -hmm. anyone who's running a machine, whether a dimper or a router, right, the parts don't come off in a nice, convenient sequence. Right, 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 right. right. If you want to yep. get a good yield, you got to put stuff together. The more stuff you put together, the more of a mess you get on the backside. That's right. So whether we're coming off a dimper, where we can inkjet the cart slot definition on every part, mm -hmm. right? So we not only know the slot position, we know the cart. So if you have a bigger job, we can have multiple carts on the on this on the mm -hmm. sort line. Mm -hmm. Right. We can also do the same thing on a nesting machine or a beam saw. Right. Right. Any, anything that generates the original component will define the barcode as to it is what it's going to be, and we can organize it right from the very beginning. Right. So this uh, concept of cart slotting um, is one of what you were saying. Um, yeah, this is an example of the paperwork that Envision would generate. Okay. So basically, this is for a door. So basically, right, uh, item item six is going into slot one, uh, three, four. So the, the styles and the rails are going to specific slots, mm -hmm. right? And so this paperwork, this is similar to what we're going to do this afternoon. So this is this is really kind of taking that uh, the logic that we were talking about as far as trying to navigate the parts through the shop floor to, to even another level where now the software is telling you, okay, this is what slot to stick it into this cart because, organized by assembly because that's what eventually it's going to have to get to. Right, the, because we know where it's going right. and we know in what order it has to get there. Right. Yeah. And also, say, for example, if I'm making face frame cabinets because it's a good example, right, my boxes might be coming from a beam saw nesting machine. Mm -hmm. My frame parts and my door parts are going to be coming off a chop saw. That's right. That's right. right. And, and they're going to be fed from a rip saw. So yep. I have all these different points of origin. I can organize my cart slotting for my wood pieces differently than I am my sheet goods, mm -hmm. right? Or I can create one cart that it's going to accept everything. So my cart can go from my beam saw over to my dimter, right? Or I can define it as I want to organize all my sheet goods here and all my wood parts here, right? Mm -hmm. And so it can have just two separate origins, right? And so then I just merge those together, and I'll they'll be organized two different carts feeding all my frame parts, my door parts, and my carcass parts all in assembly together. All all together, right? Yeah. So okay. now with uh, so with Cadet, real quick, just kind of run through. So Cadet is one of those satellite softwares that hook onto Envision. Correct? It is. Yeah. So um, 
So yeah. yeah so you put the other one back up. Okay. The, uh, the PDF. Okay. So this is this is the card slot document, right? To go back to it, right? So this is card ID thirty three uh, sixty nine, mm -hmm. and it has a barcode, right? All these pieces are, are stored uh, on a server database, mm -hmm. right? Along with the card slot identification, right? So the the part, whether it comes in label form or the inkjet on the on the saw, is going to identify the cart, and then you have the slots, mm -hmm. and then this right here is the assembly numbers. Okay. Right. So we know how we want to populate this. So as this this paperwork is attached to the cart, what we're going to do is we're going to set up these stations where we're going to scan that barcode, right? Because it's, uh, the way it works is as what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to track that barcode. As, as the card identity, and we're going to as that cart moves around, it's going to be populated. So the way Envision populates the cart is it's going to have no voids. Mm -hmm. So this cart shouldn't leave the station it's at if there's any voids in it. Right. Right. And so you'll know if they're missing anything right away. Right away, and just you, by just by looking at it. You don't even have to check the list. You're just if, looking at it. You know. If you are missing something, you'll see I'm missing something in slot four. Slot four is a top. It's mm -hmm. this top with this machine code in it. Mm -hmm. Right. It should right. be this size by this size. So yep. you see what's missing. Yeah. Right. And so as that as you populate your cart, and then you take the cart, for example, from a nested machine to an edge bander, mm. to finishing, right. to right. assembly. Yes. Right. You can follow that cart outside of our world of machines. That's right. That's right. Right, and just by scanning this right here, you'll create these stations. I feel like a weather person. <laughs> okay, so uh, the thing about Cadets, much like Envision, it, do it doesn't have a fixed format. You, the user, create whatever stations you want. Mm -hmm. Right, we're independent of the actual machines because we're just stations scanning the barcode. All right, so let's time out right there because I think that's an important point for everyone to understand. So when you're dealing with Envision and specifically with Cadet, um, Cadet does work on kind of like a, it, it utilizes stations and stations does not have to, uh, they're not be machines, tied. right? So they're not directly tied to machines. You can set up a cadet station at say assembly. Yes. Right. So you're not, or finishing or, or finishing. You're not using a whole server machine to finish the products, but you can still set up a cadet station at finishing in order to continue that process flow and have more visibility over it. And just like with the attributes of the product for machining, you can assign attributes in the template to help the downstream process. It's like, what finish does this part get? Sure, absolutely. And if you have a code right. for your finishing line, you right. can incorporate that. We can set up barcode labels on the parts that you could scan and potentially set that kind of stuff up. So while Envision and Cadet um, obviously work great with, um, with, with generating machine code, uh, and making sure that uh, everything's machined correctly, uh, it's not, uh, that's not where it ends. Uh, yeah. it, it continues on to the entire manufacturing process, which kind of brings us to the title of, of what we're talking about, this whole concept in modern manufacturing, actually being able to tie that flow together, have everything defined up front at order entry, and then just seeing it flow through the shop. Yeah, and for this example, this is a sheet good example where I have a, a nested base route, an edge band, a horizontal boring machine. Mm -hmm. So I can create these stations uh, for my shop floor. Right. And as that barcode is scanned at every station, so every cart has a has a list. Right. Right. You can see the last uh, station this cart was seen at was point to point mm -hmm. for the ProMaster or the molding. Okay. The yep. Molder. Right, and so you can see that these carts haven't been through these stations. Right, right, because right. Because right. they, sure. they will get ticked as, yep. as they pass through. Makes sense. Right, and because this is on the server, every station that has cadet will see the status of every station. Right, which is, which is extremely important because you want to be able to check up on those statuses, and you don't have to you don't have to walk over to a station in order to do that. That's right, and yep. and then with a within a process, you can define a station as being the final station okay right sure. right so that will highlight that that card is finished so then you're completed at yeah. that point sure yeah and not only that but if I if I was to double click a card right or I click the list I'm sorry right if there if there was a uh, information it would show you all of the parts that are in that card ah right okay right. Wait, so it, again looking at that looking at that list you see that a cart is then made up of all these different right. Okay, so yeah. then you'd be able to say, hey, uh, let me look at, you know, cart such and such, and you'd be able right. to see all your parts it, in there. Yeah, and so, like, if I'm at a different station, and I, I was interested in cart 5534, mm -hmm. I can look at the status of all, so I would not only see what's supposed to be in there, 
I'd see the status of the parts in there. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Okay. And the barcode at each station does two things. One, if you scan a cadet barcode, mm -hmm. right, it will say this card is passed through. Yep. Right. And then you can identify the individual pieces of that card. Right. If you scan a part barcode, it will induce that part into rework. Oh. On sheet goods. All right. Okay. Right. So if I have, for example, 12, 15 stations in my sheet goods shop, mm -hmm. Right. Any one of those can induce a part to the sheet goods or to the rework pool. Yep. Yep. Sure. Right. And then all you have to do once you have a, enough of a collection that you can yield it out. Once that pool is big enough, right. say, Someone, hey, then you go. Then, then any Invision user can click one button. And it'll process all the rework in the pool. All the rework. Yep. Right. And so that it'll reproduce the part with the same barcode that it had originally. Yep. Right. And so then I can take that part. Right, and the label will say the cart it's associated to. Mm -hmm. So then I can look at the cart, and I know the location of the cart, so I can catch that piece back up. Yeah, automatically. So all right, if so the rework just becomes part of the visualization and the process of the parts. Right. So let's kind of talk about the advantages of that real quick, because I think the the rework aspect of this entire system is just it, it's efficient and it's a great it's a great aspect of it. I think it makes a lot of sense. One thing that a lot of Especially shops, when it's a tie-in to the visualization. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just an add-on. Yeah, that's know. exactly right. But a lot of shops struggle with that rework. Not so much, uh, I, I think every, you know, we're all going to have to do rework. Yeah. And, and I always look at it as a shop's going to have to do rework. It's actually, it's how you do the rework that's going to, um, you know, that's going to make it either negative or neutral, right? There's no positive to it. It's either going to make it neg negative or neutral. And when you can do rework efficiently, yeah. then it, it's making it so that now <clears throat> you're not holding up an entire manu manufacturing process Yes. because you need to rework one piece, yes. okay? You're not tying up an entire machine that needs to cut like three more sheets, but you got to do this rework real quick first. And InVision has has uh, toggles in it, so you can say, for example, I want to for all my sheet goods, I want to rework everything on a nesting machine. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, for example, if I'm a large beam saw point to point manufacturer, higher volume yep. stuff, right? I don't want to shut this down. I'm running. I'm that's running. Right. I'm running that's, stacks. That's exactly right. right? I, yes. I've got four. You know, orange millimeter pieces I gotta yep. make. I don't want to shut my beam saw down because I'm running volume. Right. So, so I, I can have a nesting machine off to the side, and then it will rework your beam saw point to point uh, parts in a nest. Yep. Exactly. And that's so important because, like you said, you don't want to shut that beam saw down out of production, take it offline from production to just rework one piece. Again, the pooling aspect is so important here because you can pool parts because, especially in that scenario. Where you're taking stuff off and you don't want you don't want your beam saw doing any rework. The cost of rework of slowing you're losing the production. Yeah, you're going to lose so way. much that way. Yeah. So put it on a nest, but then you want to you don't want to nest one part, right? Ideally, it depends. It depends on how urgent that box needs to go. Oh, sure. Right. You might you might want to you might I mean the thing is also going to a nesting machine, right? I have an easier utilization of all fall. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. That's exactly right. Yes. So now you're able to pull up that rework and say, okay, now I want to handle that rework in this way yeah. so that I don't have to take this machine offline, off production line to, uh, to do this. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, I can't say like how, what a key component that is. I mean, that's uh, something that all of us struggle with of dealing with that rework. Yeah, you can choose that I want my rework on a beam saw point to point to be beam saw point to point, mm -hmm. and my nesting be nesting. Or you can say on Sheikah's, I want all my rework moved over to nesting. Yep, right. And right? so it'll make the exact same part on the nesting machine and then do it in one step, which mm -hmm. also shortens that time to get your rework back caught up. That's right. Because I'm not I'm not going from the buffer of station to station, I'm doing it all in one spot. That's right. Right, and so then I can just take it from there, the edge banner and, and go forward. And then, and then and then once the rework is done, even if it was like, I don't know, tomorrow or the next day the rework's done, you know what cart and that I can go rework to, I can go goes. to any of the 12 stations or 15 stations where Cadet is, and I, I the label says what cart and what slot it goes to. Yep. So I go to any station, I find its cart, 
and then I see the last last station it was seen, and I walk it directly over. And you say, okay, there you go. I just caught this part back up. Yep. There you go. And, and the other car, you can choose if you want to continue or if you want mm -hmm. to stop once parts are over. So anywhere. that's it, because that's the other that's the other challenge that uh, so many of us have is, well, what do you do with the rest of these parts? I got I got 50 parts waiting can't, on can't this one it. part. Can't can't do anything yep. with can't them. Where, the where do they go? Normally they uh, they hang out in a corner somewhere. Right. And, well, the and thing then is, we forget about them. And because because it's like that, what people end up doing, they have to throw a lot of labor at rework. Yes, exactly. Right? That's exactly right. They throw a lot of labor and they throw a lot of material at it, right, because of the cost of not doing it. Right. Right. Because there is, there typically is not a convenient pool of rework parts, a method of, of getting that and gathering that pool. That's right. And then executing the pool of parts mm -hmm. to catch it back up to get your assemblies out the door. So Daniel, let's kind of uh, back up and kind of uh, just kind of close this out with, okay. um, you know, kind of recapping with the principles of um, modern manufacturing and how and how through um, how through Envision and uh, the satellite softwares that we've talked about today, you can do so much just at the point of order entry. Kind of wrap it up. Well, I think that um, if you were to look at our industry, right? And if you go around, and I, I know this from uh, people that we've hired in, you no know, one side or the other, mm -hmm. that guy, uh, <laughs> right? The the surprise at how far in advanced our woodworking understanding is, mm. right? Because right. if you really look at the average customer, they're they're very familiar with modern sheet good production. That's right. Right. What we've done is we've taken a a, a very uh, what I think is a very positive mindset on wood. And where they cross mingle on the floor is we've applied that concept into some sheet goods ideas that are very conventional, I like see. beam saw and nesting, mm -hmm. right? But the downstream stuff we we see a void, yeah, right? right. And so right. on the other side, right, some of the modern sheet goods stuff was we've tried to incorporate that into the wood side and mm -hmm. create, uh, for example, uh, on the on the higher volume line, right? If you were to look at like a retrieval system beam saw point to point nesting, right, right. Where I just order the thing, and it's like a vending machine. Parts just come out, mm -hmm. right? And now, now it's organized and, and defined as far as cart spot. We, we try to, we want to create that mindset on the on the wood side, right? And that's one of the things we're going to be showing this afternoon in the rip cut line. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so but the idea is we want to have same concept on both sides of the industry, same level of integration and automation, right? Right. It, it was the same small level of choice on the floor. So when we're talking about modern manufacturing. A, a lot of this has been established or adopted on that panel processing side, but we take it to both sides, solid yes. panel processing. It looks different, it but, does when, look but different, when you but watch it, it's the, the same. And the principles are the same. Yeah. Principles are absolutely the same. Yeah. yeah. Now, so later on this afternoon, um, we'll do a plug for uh, later on. So we are taking the live stream up to Hickory, North Carolina. Um, where we have an entire line set up. You yep. want to talk just a minute about what yeah. that line does? Yeah, we have a, uh, a rip optimizer, a moving blade rip saw, uh, followed by a sweep deck, lateral chain feed, into a marking station, uh, and a lateral chain feed feeding a Dimter crosscut saw. What we're going to do is we're going to go to Envision and we're going to order, for example, 12 custom doors. Okay. Three doors like this, three doors like that, make them just different. Okay, right. right. Same species, yep. but just different because uh, what we're going to show. And so we're just going to save that order, right? And then we're going to import it at the rip saw, and that's all we're going to. The only interface between the operator and the machines is an import at the rip saw. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to coordinate. The rip saw will then coordinate the information that it received about the components it needs for these lists. Right. It's going to forward all that information to the chop saw. That's right. And it's going to take, uh, because of uh, the way the system runs, is it will understand the yield loss on the crosscut saw and factor that into the rip saw per species per thickness. Sure. Right, so for example, you talked about your custom door shop. They typically run multiple species. Well, not all species have the same crosscut yield. That's exactly right. This takes that into account automatically based on life cycle and history. Ah, uh, right. Right, so it, it will know what you average in cherry versus what you average in maple and mm -hmm. factor that into your rip saw. Mm -hmm. So right. you're doing one import at the rip saw. And that's it. And the line is taking care of the rest of it. Everything else is so, just going to, we're going to feed boards in the rip saw. It's going to cross transfer over. It's going to yep. rip randoms and fix widths. Yep. It's going to transfer over. Now, in this case, we want to show that you don't need, if you want to do high level automation, you don't need scanner. I mean, scanners are great in the right application, 
but just because you want high level automation doesn't mean you can't accomplish a lot of it with that with just high level integration mm -hmm. so all the guy with the crayon is doing is marking out what's not a cabinet door that's a, yep, that's right it. and then he, then he lays it on the deck and, and then everything's going to come through the sort line right it's going to be cut and sorted to dimension and fed on our sort line identified as style rail or panel how Huh? With an inkjet printer. How about that? Okay. Right? And yep. we're going to identify the cart and the slot. Right? And then, then we're going to take those pieces and take them directly from our... We're going to only have two kickers. One kicker for style and rail, one for panel. Okay. And we're going to look at all the parts. And we're going to say, that's this slot. That it's going to, it's just going to be like the, the post office. Right? Yep. Right. 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 And everything's going to go in the right slot. And then you're going to see 12 unassembled doors, it cart slotted, ready to go. Right? And the whole thing should take about three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. And, All right. And no one running any of the machines has any idea what we've ordered. So without giving too much of it away, yeah, so that's later on today uh, on the live stream. And so um, that's... Sparkle dust. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so make sure that's going to be, uh, I think that's the last uh, session that we're running today um, on day two of the retool tour. And uh, it's going to be quite the sight to see. Um, not only is it impressive because of the highly automated uh, uh, nature of it and the highly integrated nature of it, it's also pretty impressive to see because uh, the line is, uh, I mean, it's pretty substantial. Um, yeah, but so. I mean, the, the thing that's really important is when people talk about investing capital, mm -hmm. right? If this is a standard ripsaw with a standard optimizing deck, it's, it's just a sweep deck and a lateral chain, right. an LCF, a guy with a crayon and a standard dimpter saw. Yep. There's nothing custom. The only thing that's really custom is how the order is being navigated and integrated that's, through, this, through the that's line. Right. That's right. right. So there's nothing special about any of this equipment. This is all standard winding product. Mm -hmm. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we will uh, get you up to Hickory later on today. Um, but uh, following this, a couple things about Retool Tour uh, day number two is we are going to uh we're going to continue our live stream uh today uh with running some more machines uh downstairs uh we're going to be later on we're going to be introducing the shoda router so that's exciting too so keep tuned in on facebook and youtube all day today uh to see the rest of our live stream all right um and also make sure you, uh, you go over to wineandculture.com where we're live streaming uh, throughout the day as well. So that might be a little bit easier. Um, then, or then YouTube you're on or Facebook. Michigan, right? Yes, and then tomorrow uh, we're going to be taking the live stream to, uh, to Michigan. Right? So, uh, <laughs> Weird. Uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be headed up to Grand Rapids to go see Scarlet Machinery. Uh, and so that's going to be tomorrow. Uh, so anyway, um, that's a little bit of housekeeping for the Retool Tour. Um, so. Again, just make sure you stay tuned, uh, stay subscribed, and drop us a comment in the feed if you have any questions about what we're talking about. Daniel, thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank you. your time Thank today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yep. Thank you.